The 2015 MacBook Pro was the last of Apple's classic Retina MacBook Pros before they switched over to the Touch Bar models in 2016. These machines were, and still are, much loved by content creators. Many long-time Mac owners still regard it as the best MacBook Pro Apple ever made. But, as we head towards 2023, it's approaching 8 years old. So, is it still worth buying? And is it still a useful tool for content creation? Let's take a look. To begin with, let's go over the specifications of the MacBook Pro I'm looking at in this video. This is the mid-2015 15-inch MacBook Pro containing an Intel Core i7-4770HQ CPU with 4 cores and 8 threads, 16GB of DDR3 RAM and a 512GB PCI Express SSD. The GPU, which is probably the weakest point of this machine, is the integrated Iris Pro 5200. Apple also released a model of this laptop at the same time with a dedicated Radeon R9 M370X. That's definitely worth choosing over this one if you can find it since it roughly doubles the graphics performance. However, it does tend to sell for higher prices on eBay as a result. The display on this MacBook is a 2880x1800 resolution IPS panel with 300 nits brightness and 91% sRGB coverage. This is still above average for laptop screens even today, and so this screen holds up remarkably well. It's bright and sharp with vibrant colours, and for video and photo editing it still works very well. One thing that does age it a little though are the bezels, which are pretty big by today's standards. They can be a little jarring at first if you're moving from a laptop with smaller bezels, but you soon get used to them and no longer notice them. The keyboard on the 2012 to 2015 Retina MacBook Pros is widely regarded as one of the best laptop keyboards Apple ever made. It's a pleasure to type on with the perfect amount of key travel and it's much more reliable than the butterfly keyboards that replace them. It also doesn't have the touch bar taking up the entire top row of keys. This was Apple's first 15 inch MacBook Pro to feature a force touch trackpad. So it has the same multi-touch and force click technology as today's MacBooks, and it strikes just the right balance in my opinion between size and functionality. The trackpads on the touch bar Macs that followed it were much bigger, taking up almost the entire middle of the palm rest, and I found them a bit too large for my taste. Connectivity is definitely this laptop's biggest strength when compared to later Macs. This was the last MacBook to come with a full array of ports before Apple switched over to Thunderbolt 3 the next year and relegated us all to dongle hell. On the left side we have a MagSafe 2 port for charging, next to that we have two Thunderbolt 2 ports and the first of two USB 3 ports and a 3.5mm headphone jack. Over on the other side we have a very welcome SD card slot, an HDMI port for connecting to an external display and the second USB 3 port. The HDMI port can output 4K, but only at 30Hz refresh rate. If you want 4K60, then you'll have to use one of the two Thunderbolt ports instead, and a mini display port to HDMI cable. You can also use the Thunderbolt ports to attach an eGPU using Apple's Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 adapter. The performance will be slightly less than if you were using a Mac with Thunderbolt 3 natively, but there's only around a 5-10% to difference depending on the GPU. The SSD performance measured in Blackmagic Disk Speed Test is around 1.4GB per second for write and 2GB per second for read, which still holds up well today. In fact, the read speed is 30% faster than the SSD in the current entry-level 2022 M2 MacBook Air. But where this MacBook has a massive advantage over the current models is that the SSD can be removed and upgraded. Unlike current Macs where the SSD is soldered, you can take this one out, upgrade it with a larger Apple SSD, or you can use a simple adapter from Amazon to install a standard NVMe drive. I always seem to find myself needing more storage, so this is a very big deal. The Core i7-4770HQ in this laptop was certainly no slouch, but it was released in 2014, meaning that it's getting on for 9 years old. So, how does it perform today? Surprisingly well actually. 
In Geekbench 5, it manages 851 single core and 3411 multi core. Surprisingly, this score actually beats the 2016 15 inch MacBook Pro that replaced it, and it comes within spitting distance of the 2017 15 inch. It wasn't really until the release of the 2018 MacBook Pro with a 6 core CPU instead of quad core that the MacBook Pro line saw any significant CPU performance increase. In normal day-to-day -day tasks like web browsing and emails, I really don't notice any difference between this MacBook and my M1 MacBook Air. It's only when editing 4K video in Final Cut Pro or editing high megapixel RAW photos in Lightroom that you begin to notice the speed difference. For most users, the 2015 MacBook Pro will be more than powerful enough to do any task you need. The battery life for this model was very good when compared to other laptops released at the same time. When new, Apple quoted a battery life of 9 hours, but in real life it was more like 7 to 8 hours. Even now, at around 8 years old, I still get around 6 hours of moderate use before the battery dies. Obviously, if you're doing heavy tasks like video editing, then you're going to see significantly less than that. For video editing, this is still a very capable machine. Final Cut Pro is well optimized for Apple hardware, and I had no issues editing 4K video using this MacBook. You do get the occasional dropped frames while it's still rendering, and exports do take longer than they would with a newer Mac, but it's still perfectly usable. People have been editing videos on these machines for years, and they don't suddenly stop being able to edit videos just because they got older. Although it's no longer cutting edge, the 2015 MacBook Pro is still quite thin when compared to most notebooks on the market today. I certainly wouldn't call it bulky. For comparison, compared to the current 16-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip, it's about 10% lighter and just over 1mm thicker, so there's very little difference. Apple dropped official OS support for the 2015 MacBook Pro with the release of macOS Ventura in October 2022. However, you can still use OpenCore Legacy Patcher to install Ventura and it works very well. I'll put a link to OpenCore Legacy Patcher down in the video description. So is it still worth buying now? Yes, it's still a really solid notebook and still capable of most of the tasks that people need to use a computer for today. If you're a content creator on a budget, or if you just want an everyday Mac for day-to-day -day use, then at current prices, it's a bargain. Used Intel Mac prices have been falling across the board since Apple switched to ARM. Three or four years ago, a 2015 15-inch MacBook Pro would still have set you back the best part of $800. By last year they were selling for around $500 to $600, and now you can get one in good condition from $350 to $400. I wouldn't pay more than about $400 or euros for the integrated graphics model, and maybe another $50 to $70 on top of that for the model with a dedicated GPU. $400 should get you a very capable used MacBook with several years of useful life left in it. And let's not forget the most important feature, the iconic glowing Apple logo on the back of the lid. I hope you found this video useful. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.